Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and we are back with an update on my ham radio adventure. The last time we talked about this topic, I had just passed my technician license exam, but I did not yet have the license itself. I did get the license finally, and I've been on the air now for about two or three weeks, and I managed to contact somebody through the International Space Station the other day. So what I thought I would do is show you all the things that I'm doing with ham radio when I'm first starting out here. I am a real novice to this. I haven't really explored radio all that much in the past. So I think this video might be helpful for other people getting into this hobby. And so far I've done everything through this little handheld radio. Now I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that everything in this video I paid for with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see how this novice has gotten himself on the air. Now the radio that I'm starting out with is what we mentioned in the last video. This is an Anytone 878 UV2+. And now that I've got a couple of weeks of usage under my belt, I have to say this is a great starter radio if you are looking to get into this hobby. It works really well over analog repeater stations. I was able to communicate with one that's not far from my home. The best thing is that it is able to communicate with that repeater even inside. It's not that far away, maybe three or four miles or so. Uh, there's another repeater about 15 miles away that I'm able to reach from my back porch with this. Again, just with the rubber duck antenna. It transmits at about six or seven watts, depending on the band that you're using. The battery life is great on it. And in addition to communicating over analog uh, repeaters and radios, it's able to communicate with digital radios that support the DMR standard. There is a bit of a learning curve to its software, but once you figure it out and how all of the configurations translate into how the radio works, it makes a lot more sense. Now, what I did to get started is I went over to repeaterbook.com and I looked for all of the repeaters that were near my home. They have things sorted out at the county level, but you can also type in an address. And for example, this is my uh, closest repeater that's on the roof of my old high school. And you can see here, I just transposed the data from here into the AnyTones configuration software. This runs on Windows only, unfortunately. So if you are on other platforms, you'll need to have a Windows computer kicking around. And you can see here, I've got the downlink and uplink frequencies dialed in. There's also a tone that you have to generate in order to be able to transmit through the repeater. And you just type that in or enter that in down here. There's a drop down menu. And most repeaters require uh, that you put in a tone in order to access that repeater. That way they're not just broadcasting static they pick up or whatever. Now what a repeater does is it takes in a signal on one frequency and rebroadcasts it out on another. So that allows you to extend its reach. So for example, the repeater that's about 15 miles away from me, I was able to communicate with someone who was 30 miles away and I would normally not be able to reach that person directly. So when you go through a repeater, you can extend the range of your transmissions, especially if you are a technician licensee like me and don't have the ability to go out on some of the lower frequency bands that have a longer range. Now, as I mentioned, the radio also supports digital communications via DMR. And digital communications are attractive for a couple of reasons. One of them is that your voice is a lot cleaner over it because it's a digital versus an analog signal but also these digital signals are more efficient. So you can actually fit two conversations on the same amount of bandwidth per frequency that you could with just an analog conversation. So there's a lot of reasons why DMR is an attractive standard to use. And I was able to dial into my local ARES group that meets every Sunday night. And ARES is an emergency response group. It consists of amateur radio operators who are prepared should there be some kind of natural disaster or other thing occur where you may not have infrastructure to communicate through. So if the phone lines go out and everything is down, uh, radios still work. As long as you've got a radio and a power source, you can transmit voice and data. And this group is always prepared to offer that to first responders and local governments and others should something go 
wrong and they meet every week over the radio just to make sure everybody has still got all of their pieces in place and any events that are going on that they can uh, meet up and uh, help each other with different things. And the group meets over DMR and DMR can be a little complicated to set up. So you have to set up a talk group here uh, and make sure you're dialed into the right talk group when that meeting takes place. As you can see, I've got three talk groups dialed in right now that I have been on. And then on the radio here, once you've got it all programmed in, you just select the talk group that you want the radio to be listening and transmitting on, and then you can participate. I was surprised that it worked for me on the first shot. I was able to be heard uh, on the local meeting when I got started. And then uh, after the meeting, the leader of my local region called me up and spent about an hour on the phone with me, just giving me some advice on the best ways to expand my expertise within this new hobby for me. And that's been one of the best things about amateur radio is that every ham operator I meet, either over the radio or in person, has been so helpful and welcoming uh, as I've been getting started here. Sometimes in the tech world, the newbies are often uh, kind of looked down upon, but in the ham radio hobby, it's the exact opposite. Everyone really wants to help you learn uh, as you go. And of course, there's a lot of great YouTube resources, but you'll also find a lot of great resources locally uh, just by contacting people through your local repeater. Now, if you're looking to get into DMR, it is a little more complicated than analog repeaters. You also need to register for a radio ID number so that you can be identified. This is in addition to your FCC call sign. And you can go to radioid.net to register. And there's some great tutorials on the Bridgecom YouTube channel about how to get onto your local digital repeater and communicating. There's a lot of dials to turn uh, on digital that you won't have on the analog side. Now what I want to do though is talk about how I communicated through another repeater, one that was orbiting in space. There is a repeater on the International Space Station and you've got a couple of minutes every couple of hours where you can actually communicate to other ham operators through the use of the space station. And as I mentioned, uh, going through a repeater extends your range tremendously, and I was able to do that. In fact, I reached a ham in Ithaca, New York, and that's about 300 miles away from my location here in Connecticut. Here's how I did it. Now, the first thing you should do is visit aris.org so you can get an idea as to what the ham radios installed on the space station are currently up to. Now, there are two off-the-shelf Kenwood radios up there. As you can see at the time I'm recording this video, one of those radios is on and operating as a crossband repeater. So it is listening at 145,990. And just like our repeaters on the ground, you have to transmit this tone in order to activate the repeater. And then anything it receives after that tone, it will transmit back down at 437.800. Now, sometimes the astronauts might actually be monitoring the station, and occasionally you might be able to communicate with one, but most of the time, uh, the station is just a repeater where you'll be talking to other hams that are on the ground, but within sight of the space station as it orbits overhead. Now, occasionally they change the mode of the radio into a packet radio where you can send APRS data packets up to the station, and it'll respond back down with its own packet and other hams will be able to see those communications going back and forth. So you can send little data messages like your website or whatever or your email address uh, through the space station. And I'm eager to try that uh, when it's in that mode. There's another radio on board also. As you can see right now, it is not active, but every couple of weeks they do a uh, slow scan television experiment where they beam down images and you have to configure software to receive that image. I haven't done this yet, uh, but I will be messing around with that uh, the next time they do it. And it looks like I just missed their slow scan TV experiment that happened on June 8th and 9th. Uh, but you can find a lot of images that hams have been able to receive from the station when they've got everything configured properly. Now, how do you find the space station? Well, the best way is to just look online. You can just type in ISS location and you'll see all sorts of maps come up with where the station is at the moment. But I have found this app called GoSat Watch to be really helpful because the ISS is not the only amateur radio repeater in orbit. There's a lot of satellites up there that you can communicate through. And this app keeps track of them and shows you where in the sky it'll be. 
So for example, if I want to see the next ISS pass, it looks like we'll be getting one around 2 p.m. this afternoon. But as you can see, it's very low on the horizon here. So my ability to pick it up at my house is probably pretty minimal. So I can just keep popping through here and see uh, how things improve over the course of the day. So this one at 5.13 p.m. looks like my best shot. It's going to be right overhead around 5.17 and then it will be over the horizon at 520. So I've got about a six minute or so period of time in which I can conduct these communications. And I was able, as I mentioned, to reach somebody in Ithaca, New York. And what was great was that he recorded the communication so you can hear what it sounded like on his end. Have a listen. Two Delta, this is uh, Kilo Charlie One, Romeo, Gulf Sierra, Fox Trot, November 31. C1, RG, Aston, Alpha, Delta, Two Delta, Delta, Fox, November 1, 2. So as you could hear, my signal was a bit weak on his end, but he could hear it. And I've been surprised how clear these signals come in, even when I have the little rubber duck antenna attached. But in order to really reach the satellite, you're going to need another antenna. And I picked up this one. <laughs> this is the uh, Aero Antenna 2. It's designed for FM satellite communications. And as you can see, it is a bit large and it's handheld. And what you have to do is essentially, if I don't destroy my studio here, is kind of point it in the direction of where the station is, because this is a bit of a uh, directional kind of activity. So you have to keep an eye on the app and just move the antenna as the station is overhead. And if you are out shopping for this antenna or one like it, um, what you need to get here, if I don't break everything first, is a duplexer. And mine actually had that duplexer installed because remember, the station is transmitting and receiving on two different radio bands. And this antenna allows for tuning into both of those bands in one. But my radio only has a single port on it. So I got the one with the duplexer. And what happens here is that the uh, two elements that are plugged in go into the duplexer. And then I've got a single cable going out to the radio. So if you are out shopping for an antenna, make sure it's got the duplexer because what you're going to do is unscrew the rubber duck antenna and plug in the satellite antenna into its SMA connector here at the top, at least for the Anytone radio. Uh, the connector on the end of the duplexer, though, uh, is a BNC connector, so you do need to get a BNC to SMA adapter so that you can screw it into the radio. But once you do all that, and point your antenna in the direction of the ISS or the satellite you're trying to communicate through, you will eventually be able to make contacts even with a low-powered handheld radio like this one. And I was really excited when I finally made my first ISS contact. Now, I got a couple of other tips for communicating with the space station. The first is adjusting for the Doppler effect. So unlike a local repeater where I just have a single channel programmed in, on the space station, I have seven because the Doppler shift will impact the frequency as it's moving towards you and away from you. So if you want the widest possible time in which you can listen to the space station, you should program in frequencies to adjust for the Doppler effect. And if you pause the video right here, uh, you can see on the left-hand side the adjustments that I dialed in from a few tips that I saw online. And what I do is as I start to hear things kind of fizzle out, I will adjust this and see what comes in stronger. Uh, there are programs for more advanced radios that make this adjustment automatically, but for me, <laughs> kind of figuring things out here, I just turn my channel dial to uh, adjust for that Doppler shift in a very unscientific way. But I found I was able to tune in uh, to that pass that I was successful on for the whole part of the pass, a good five or six minutes. And I was pretty pleased with myself uh, for that. The second thing is to know what to say when the station is overhead because everyone has a very short window of time. So really what you've got time for is your call sign and your map grid location because what people want to know is where you are. How far can we get through this repeater? So when I went on the air, I just did my phonetic alphabet of my call sign and then my map grid location, and that was enough for the guy in Ithaca to hear it and say, hey, I got gotcha, you, uh, and we moved on from there. So be on the lookout. You're going to hear uh, the call sign and the map grid, and you really shouldn't be communicating more than that because everyone's really just trying to make a quick contact to add to their logbook as the station 
comes overhead. Now, if you don't know your map grid location, you can go to this website that was put together by K2DSL to find it. You just type in your address and it will give you the grid location here. As you can see, uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is FM 18 LV. And again, when you go on the air for the ISS repeater, it is the call sign and the grid location, and then you listen to see who heard it. Now, the ISS is not the only game in town when it comes to satellite communication. There's a bunch of others out there. AMSAT.org is a great website to explore to learn more about some of the other satellites up there and what you can do through them. And they have a status page here that is updated quite regularly uh, to give you an idea as to what is currently active and what kinds of communications you can expect to do through those satellites. And again, all you need is the handheld radio and that Aero 2 antenna to get started. Now, in my last video, I mentioned I was very interested in data communications over amateur radio, and that is often called packet radio. And I've been able to get packet radio transmissions going on my Anytone radio here, but I had to buy a few more things. Now, back in the 80s and 90s, prior to the internet really becoming adopted by the masses, there were packet radio bulletin board systems that were run on computers that you could access only over the air using a ham radio and another piece of hardware called a terminal node controller. And basically your computer would communicate through the terminal node controller. It would transmit data out over the air and receive it and then send that data to the computer. Nowadays, because computers are much more powerful, the terminal node controller or TNC can run in software, which makes it a little easier to work with. Although I found that my Anytone radio here would not work properly if I just plugged it into the audio ports on my computer. So although this does have a mic and a headphone jack on it, when I had both connected to the computer, it was keying the mic and transmitting as long as those cables were connected, which is not how it's supposed to work. You want it to transmit and then turn the transmitter off after that data packet was sent out. So I had to pick up another piece of hardware here to make things work properly. This is called the Signal Link USB. This is a USB sound card designed for radios like mine. And you have to get a uh, matching unit here and cable to the radio that you're trying to connect with. And inside I installed a little chip that they sell to allow it to properly key the radio on and off when I want to transmit data packets. And this has been working great now. And what you do is just plug this box uh, into your computer with a standard USB cable here and you are off and running. Unfortunately, there's not much to do on packet radio around my neck of the woods here. Uh, the most popular data transmission thing happening right now is called APRS, which allows ham operators to send basic location data. And you can see here W1RPQ is driving around in his car and transmitting his location every so often, and you can see the path that he took. Now this is helpful for finding other hams in the area around you, of course, but it's also very useful if there is a natural emergency of some kind that knocks out the local infrastructure, because all you need to do is give a little handheld radio like mine uh, to an ambulance operator, for example, and their control center will know where everybody is at all times without the need for any local infrastructure to transmit the data. And one of the nice things about the Anytone radio here is that it does support the sending of its location over APRS when you configure things. So for example, if I go over to my APRS zone here and tune into the APRS channel that I set up, all I have to do is just key the mic here and it automatically just sends out my location via one of these APRS packets. Now, related to the emergency use here, when I was on the phone with the local ARES contact, he told me about something that they do have set up here that's very similar to a BBS called WinLink. Now, WinLink is a global email network, and here in my state, the ARES folks set up WinLink stations all over the place, so everybody in my state of Connecticut can reach one of these stations and send email to each other. But it connects up with the internet, too, so if there's a station that's on the internet, it can receive messages over the air and route them out over the internet. And if there are stations too far away from the internet, they can bounce from one to the other until it gets someplace where there's an internet connection to route that message further out. But locally, it can be used for communications just for people that are using that one particular WinLink station. 
There's not much to it. It looks like you know a 90s era email client. There's not a lot of high tech stuff going on here, but it does get the job done of transmitting email. And you can connect to WinLink over the internet or uh, connect using your radio and a software TNC. Now, a little earlier, I set up a software TNC called Direwolf, and I was able to reach my closest WinLink server, but that server is about 25 or 30 miles away, and I had to bring out my radio satellite antenna and kind of hold it up in the air until I could get that signal through. So I am going to need a more powerful radio and a larger antenna, I think, to reach it on a regular basis. But I was able to connect up with it. It was actually pretty thrilling when I finally got the response back after trying for so long. And I was able to get a short email message sent out. And I was able to verify that that message got out to the network because WinLink has a database of every message that goes through its network. Remember, as we said in the last video, all of the communication over amateur radio has to be unencrypted and freely readable by anyone listening. And that is true of data communications as it is with voice communications. But it was fun here to see that the message that I sent out through my local gateway uh, over my local frequency here managed to get into the network just through the air without having to dial a phone number or pay for a subscription to anything. It just worked, and that was really cool. Uh, next up on my list, though, is to try to figure out how to set up a BBS system of my own. And before I'm able to do that, I'm going to need to get an antenna installed on the house. I'm going to need my base station because it has to run 24-7 listening for people dialing in. So in the short term, I'm going to try to get a more reliable connection to my WinLink server. I know there's another BBS operating that isn't too much farther away from where that WinLink location is. So I'm going to try to hit that as well and then try to find some way to reliably connect to everything uh, using packet radio. As I mentioned, it was more popular back in the 80s. So nowadays, uh, things feel very disjointed insofar as how you might get a Windows computer to connect up to one of these BBSs. And I need to do more research to find something that's really going to work for me. Now, if you are someone doing packet radio out there and have a really good method of accessing packet BBSs, please let me know down in the comment stream because I've been playing with a whole bunch of different stuff and I haven't yet found something that really feels like it's going to work for me. Although I'm going to start messing around on the Raspberry Pi because it looks like the packet stuff is a little more solidified on the Raspberry Pi these days. And there's a few BBSs now running uh, throughout the world on Raspberry Pis. And there's even an amateur radio packet uh, operating system essentially running uh, on the Pi that you can download. So a lot more to kind of explore here as I continue my amateur radio journey, but a lot of you were curious as to where things were at. And I'm making good progress, I think, figuring everything out. I'm, I think I'm ready now to go and get one of my base stations and uh, get a little further into this. I also want to uh, get my uh, general license, which is the next step up, because right now I can't access most of the high frequency bands where you could do more longer range communication. So I definitely want to get that figured out because I do want to play with some of the weak signal stuff out there that's very popular right now. I covered that in my second SDR video, which you can find linked down below in the video description. And many of you know Crix, who makes uh, flash cartridges for the uh, old game consoles out there. Well, he's got one on the Sega Genesis called uh, the EverDrive Pro, and he's actually turned that cartridge and a Sega Genesis into a weak signal radio, and he's been sending weak signals all over the world with it, which is really neat. And I've got one of those cartridges and can do it, so I just need to get uh, my next license so that I can access the popular frequencies for that activity. So there's a lot more to come here with this. I'm sure a lot more stuff to buy, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you with some great advice down in the comments section as I continue my journey as a real newbie in amateur radio. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. 
If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.